Proverbs chapter 14. Thank you, Barry. Good job. Good job. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 14. The scripture says, The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. The word backslider is the heart of what I want to share with you today because the Bible has a lot to say about backsliding. What is that term? Well, first of all, that's an insurance term, backslide. If you don't pay your insurance premium, what happens to your policy? Who said that? It doesn't backslide, it what? It lapses. That's the word I'm looking for. Because if you lapse, that means that it ceases to be. It's also a medical term. Because when a person becomes ill, they lapse into sickness. But through treatment, they begin to get better. But if something goes wrong, they don't take their medicine, what happens? They relapse. That's right. They go back just like they were. This word backsliding is a theological term and it talks about either lapsing into sin or relapsing back into the world. There are those who start out to follow God. They're on fire for God. They can't get enough of God. They're excited about God. But then something happens and they relapse. They backslide. They get away from God. They go back to their former life. They go back to things that they should not be involved with. As examples, the Bible has many names that really would cause us all to shudder when we think about them. For instance, one of those names would be Judas Iscariot. Because here is one who lapsed, as it were. Demas is another where the Bible says of him, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Names like David and Bathsheba linked together to reveal the condition of their heart and the activities of their life. And David, when he repents, he prays, Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Names like Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament who lie to God and end up being killed. As, un as we consider the backslider, our thoughts, my thoughts would go to a man that many of you may not know his name and yet you know about him. His name is Elimelech, found in the book of Ruth. For it was Elimelech, you remember, who lived, as the scripture says, in the days when the judges ruled. And this man lived in Bethlehem, Judah. The name of his town, Bethlehem, the house of bread, Judah, praise. So he lived in a town where God supplies the bread and where the people praise God for his grace and goodness. He's in a place of worship. He lives in, the, in a town of might and where there's all kinds of things going on for God. But there came a time when famine came. Now you would think that if this man, whose name, by the way, means God is king, that if a famine comes, that he ought to know if God is king, it's just going to be a short-lived thing because God's in control. If God is king and I'm living in the city of bread, then God is going to supply my food. If God is king and I'm offering him praise, the Bible says that he inhabits our praise and so we ought to be able to relax and rejoice in the Lord. You'd think that he would do that. As a matter of fact, don't you think that every Christian ought to know that since he is king and since he is in control, that whatever comes our way, God is in it, God's going to be with us, and God's going to supply. 
And yet there are those things that happen in people's lives who when they come, they backslide from God. Elimelech, when the famine came, he denied the sovereignty of God in his life and prepared to move himself and his family to the land of Moab. Now Moab, you remember, is a country which is under the curse of God. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 23 and verse 3, the Bible tells us that this country has been cursed by the Lord. He will have war with Moab continually, the scripture says. And so this man, who is a God man, this man whose name means God is king, when the trial comes, when some hardship comes, he says, I'm out of here. I'm going back I'm going over to Moab and I'm going to move my family there. I'm sure, I'm sure that he had a lot of good reasons for moving his family to Moab. I'm sure he might have said to his neighbors, well, there's a famine going on around here. So I've got my responsibility. I've got to feed my family. So I'm going to move over to Moab. Does that sound familiar? Do you know somebody perhaps who has said, I've got a responsibility in my family and I can't go to church because I've got to work to feed them. I, I've got a family to take care of and I can't tithe. I've got to take care of all these expenses we've got. After all, we've got a house to pay on. We've got three new cars to pay on. I've got a new boat to pay on. We've got a, a house down at the beach that we've got to visit every now and again. I have to pay on it and I've got so many things Things that are pressing me. I just hey, who told you that you had to have all those things anyhow? And so they become weights that drag you away from God and over to the land of Moab. So there's a famine going on. After all, I've got to take care of my family, and he moves over to Moab. I, or maybe he might have said, There are just no good jobs around here. And since I've, I've got a responsibility, I, I can get a better job and I can bring my children up in a place where there's going to be plenty of good jobs. Listen to me now, I'm going to meddle just a little bit. You'd be a whole lot better off, Mom and Daddy, to keep your children at home in the summer and not let them work on Sunday and get them into the house of God and spend time with them worshiping the Lord, loving God, praying together than, than a little bit of money that they're going to get, which is going to make them want to cut the ties with you and run off from home anyhow. Mm -hmm. Well, there are a lot of good jobs over there. I'm going where the money is. I'm going where the opportunity is. I'm going to go out there so that I can get whatever the world has got. Good reasons. Sounds logical. Then he says, oh, I know I'll have to raise my sons in a pagan society, but after all, me and my wife love God, and we'll pray with them, and we're going to teach them, and, uh, after, and, and we can be a witness for God. I've heard that more times than you can know of folks who took jobs in places that they knew they should not be in. Oh, preacher, the only reason I'm going to the bar now, I really don't drink. I just like to hear the music. There's a Greek word to describe that. Yeah, they, you know it, baloney, that's it. Oh, preacher, you just don't understand. I know I'm a little bit slow. I'm dense, and I just don't get some things. But I'm going to tell you right now, my brothers and sisters, when you move towards Sodom, it's not long till Sodom moves in to your heart and life. And here is a man who says, I'll just go over there, and I'll be a witness, and we won't stay long. Sin will take you farther than you want to go and sin will keep you longer 
then you want to stay and sin will cost you much more than you want to pay. I'll just move over there. It won't be long and then we'll be back. But his boys mature in Sodom. His sons marry pagan women in Sodom. His sons live in misery in Sodom. And finally his sons die along with him in Sodom or, or in Moab. So everything that he's been planning for, all the good reasons that he had to get over there didn't pan out that way at all. And he in his backsliding, lost his own family. If someone had warned Elimelech of the consequences of his move, I doubt that he would have listened. For the Bible says, and the backslider in heart is filled with his own ways. You can't talk to folks like that. You can't reason with folks like that. They've got all the answers, and they're going their own way. Well, what is the identity of a backslider? What is a backslider? Oh, preacher, I know the answer to that one, you may think. It's a man who gets out of church, cheats, steals, lies, curses, commits adultery, falls into sin, gets into crime. Well, he can do that. But that's not a good picture of a backslider. For you see, when you see a Christian out in the world, don't look at what he is doing to find his backsliding, but look at where he left God, when he left God, and what he was doing when he was leaving God. Then you'll find out what a backslider is. For you see, a backslider is a Christian, but they're careless, they're disobedient, they're unhappy, they're ineffective, and one who has suffered a relapse, a backslider. Do we have any backsliders in the place today? Someone who has become careless. And by the way, I know the meaning of that word careless. It means just not to be uh, careful. It means to uh, uh, not give attention to. But when I looked at it the other day, I saw it for the first time as the two words that are put together, care less and you get somebody who's away from God and out in the world and you try to witness to bring them back many times, they'll just tell you, I could care less. We have people whose names are on this church roll. You try to talk to them about coming to the church and they'll just say, I could care less. Boy, people are getting saved. I could care less. We're building a new building. I could care less. And I want you to know that when sin, when backsliding comes, it's like a cancer that eats at the very fiber of a man's soul and his life, and it will destroy his love for God. A backslider is a Christian, but they're careless. Are you a backslider? You know, a backslider has a real problem because they become isolated between two worlds. They're isolated between the world of sin and God's world. And they can't really enjoy either one. Now you take a person who's never come to God, they can go out and have, have, uh, get drunk and have a big time and all this other stuff that the world does and they don't feel any recrimination about that. But you let a person who has been in with God and they get away from God, man, they can't love the world and they can't love church either. They're just unhappy in both places. They can't be satisfied. They go into the world and the whole time that they're out there, something's nagging in the back of their mind that says, you shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be doing this. Why, what would God think if he came right now? And what do these people around here think? Don't they know that you used to say that you were a Christian and you're not comfortable there? You go to the house of God and when you get in the house of God, conviction comes. The preacher preaches on your sin every Sunday, doesn't he? Every time you go to church, he's preaching on your sin. Stand at the door of the church years ago, great big old football player kind of guy was coming out the door, hair falling out over the top of his shirt. He reached out, grabbed my hand, and looked into my eyes and said, Who told you about me? <laughs> the Holy Ghost of God. Listen, friend, when you have sin in your life and you get in the light of God, the light of God will always reveal those things in your life. A backslider is unhappy. He's caught between two worlds. Two worlds. Old Baptist preacher just moved into a little country situation and decided he had visited the neighborhood homes and he just started knocking on door after door 
One lady came to the door and he said to her, Does Jesus live here? And they're so flabbergasted her she couldn't speak. He asked her again, Does Jesus live here? She swallowed real hard and tried to answer and could not. And finally he just turned and left. When her husband came home that day, she told him that the preacher had visited and asked her if Jesus lived here. And she said, I didn't know what to say. He said, why didn't you tell him that our name's on the church roll and we go every now and then? She said, that's not what he asked me. He said, well, why didn't you tell him that we give money to the church? She said, that's not what he asked me. He said, well, why didn't you tell him to mind his own business? She said, the way he looked and the way he talked, I think that was his business. Does Jesus live here? Who's in command and in control of your life? My brothers and sisters, if Jesus is not Lord in your life, he's not Lord at all. And if he's not Lord in your life, then you've backslid from God. Though you may have made a profession, though you may have been baptized, though you may sometimes still come to church, you're still not where you ought to be to God. Does Jesus live here? Backsliding. That's, I learned that word early. I learned it as a Boy Scout. Boy Scout camp back yonder when five dollars was more money than I'd ever seen hardly in one place in one time. The camp counselor put a five dollar bill on top of a, a, a tall uh, tree where they'd skinned all the bark off of it and planted it out there in the middle of the, of the playground. And he put that five dollars up there and he said, whoever can climb that tree and get that five dollars, it belongs to them. Easy enough. But then he went over and he got a bucket of lard and he greased that thing down. And for, <laughs> you can see it now. All us skinny boys out there trying to hug that thing and we'd get two or three or four feet up the side of that thing, we'd slide back down. Old knobs in that thing sticking out where the limbs used to be gouging into you as you're trying to climb. Finally, one of the boys said, let's put sand on it. That'll give us traction. We can get up it then. <laughs> Have you ever tried crawling sandpaper without a shirt on? <laughs> it's not long. All the hide's gone off of your legs and off of your arms and off of your chest, and you still aren't there. And finally, one boy said, we ain't ever going to get there this way. And we got the biggest and the stoutest young one that we had and had him to hug the tree. And then one of us crawled up onto his shoulders and stood up and hugged the tree. And another one crawled up on his shoulders and got above the grease <laughs> and got that five dollars down. And the boys shared it. Teamwork worked then, it'll work now. And I want you to know, dear friend, that when you're away from God, sometimes you need somebody to come alongside of you and boost you up and point you back to the things of God and find his ways for your life. What is the condition of the backslider? The condition of the backslider is an awful condition. And it just means that they are out of shape. They're out of whack. They won't work. I saw this illustrated when I was a young father. I grew up with bicycles. And back when I was a boy, bicycle tires were big tires. They come back out with those now. But they were big tires, and, and you could just ride them and didn't seem to anything bother them. But when my children were small, they came out with those bicycles that have tires on them about the size of your thumb. Now, they'll go fast. <coughs> But I found out the importance of spokes. Because if you get a spoke that it's a little bit slack and you hit a bump, that old tire, that wheel will just twist all out of shape. Have you ever seen that? Riding along and going to jump up over the curb and you hit that thing and the wheel just folds up on you. That's the way a backslider is. They're bent out of shape. You've seen a few people who have been out of shape, haven't you? Matter of fact, some of you got bent out of shape yesterday. I don't know what it was that did it, but, but something just sort of got you all out of whack. And a person who is in a backslidden condition is not good for themselves. They're not good for the family. They're not good for God. They're just 
out cold and they're indifferent. They're out and they don't know what to do. A good picture of that is the prodigal son. You remember the story? But what put the prodigal in the hog pen? You ask anybody about him, and that's where we, all, we locate him automatically. He's in the hog pen, but what put him there? First thing I want you to note about this man is that he was unhappy at home. For he said to his father, Give me what I've got coming. What I'm going to inherit someday. Go ahead, give me. You see, when you get an attitude, instead of you being the one who is giving, you're always wanting to have your way and demand your thing and have it now. Can't wait for maturity. Can't wait for another time. But I want it now. He's unhappy at home. And so he says, I want to get out of here. I want to do my own thing. So give me what I've got coming not only is he unhappy with his home, but he's unhappy with his brother. Now you don't catch this until he comes back home. And then when the elder brother finds out what's going on, we find out the nature of that elder brother. And he's been that way all along. And he's made life miserable for his brother. How many of you grew up with an older brother? Let me see your hand. Good, many of you. How many of you know that older brothers never make a mistake? How many of you know that older brothers are perfect? How many of you know that older brothers, that uh, your parents say, why don't you be like your brother? Why don't you make grades like your brother? Why don't you, and, and we're always compared. And this boy, this younger brother, I'm sure must have had to live in the shadow of his older brother. And this brother was one of those, he was a good farmer. I'm sure his daddy told all the neighbors, hey, yeah, if I died today, my boy, my older boy could take over and he could run the farm just as good as I can. Why, you ought to just see my boy. And here's that younger brother over here living in his shadow. And he's unhappy with his home. He's unhappy with his elder brother. And he's ready to leave home. But why did he end up in the hog pen? He could have come home before he did. Did you know that? When his money started running out and he saw he didn't have enough to pay this month's rent, he could have said, I will arise and go to my father. Why didn't he? Before he pawned everything that he had and he came down to nothing, he could have gone back home because though he'd pawned his last shirt, the father's got a robe waiting over at the other house. He could have gone home. Why didn't he? He could have, but pride got in his way. And there are more people who backslide on God and refuse to return simply because of their pride. They're afraid of what somebody's going to say. They're afraid of what somebody's going to think. Hey, it doesn't make any difference what the rest of the world does or thinks as long as God's standing out there with his arms open. Hurry home, hurry home. Yeah. Get back to God. Get back. But the Proverbs are rich and Proverbs chapter 13 verse 15 says, The way of the transgressors is hard. And man, when you start away from God, I want you to know it's a bad road you're traveling. It's a hard time ahead for you when you go away from God. Why? Because you get out from under the, the umbrella of God's protection. Because when you get out there on the hillsides of life, you have lost the provision of God. When you get out there away from God, you have lost the joy of the Lord. David had a good time when he backslid and had a and committed sin with Bathsheba. But when he repented, his cry was, Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. People come to church all the time, but they are backslid in heart and they have no joy in their life. I was in a revival meeting many years ago, I suppose nearly 30 years ago, on Thursday night when I'd concluded and was about to leave, the pastor said, before you leave, come by my office. I thought in my mind, I wonder what I've done to upset him. And when I walked in his office door, 
he was sitting there sobbing and I thought, oh man, I've messed up. They're going to run him and me both off. I shut the door and I said to my friend, what's wrong, man? Because we'd had a great revival. Folks had been saved in every service. Other great decisions had been made. People had joined the church. I said, what's wrong? And through sobs, he said to me, Pastor, I've been carrying on an affair for 23 years through three different pastorates with this woman. Started in, told me all, some of the details. He was in church every Sunday. He taught, he preached, but he had no power on his life. He was away from God, cold. His life was a sham of what a preacher is supposed to be. What I want to say to you is you can sit on the front seat, you can sing in the choir, you can play an instrument, you can be uh, up preaching, you can be the greatest teacher there is and still be backslidden in your heart. Like Samson, when Samson was over there with Delilah, and she's trying to find out the source of his strength. Please take note that Samson was still judging the people of Israel. He's away from God. He's out of God's will. He's committing adultery with this prostitute. And yet, he's still judging the people of God. But one of the saddest word pictures in all the Bible is when finally his hair is cut and she says, Samson, the Philistines are upon you, that he stood and the Bible says he shook himself as before, not knowing that the Lord had departed from him. And when you get out into a backslidden condition, you not only lose your power, or lose your position. You not only lose your protection, not only do you lose God's prosperity, but you lose God's power. And I'll tell you what, there's nothing as sad as to see a shell of a man who is a used to be, a has been in the work of God. You see, our church roles are filled with people like that. Every now and again, if you drive around our county, you'll see them. There are old farm machinery sitting out in the field or out under a barn just rusting down. They're just relics of what they used to be, for they used to make a crop, and they used to help feed a family, and they used to build a farm. But now they're just worthless, rusty old relics. And our church rolls are filled with people the same way. They used to be on fire for God. They used to teach class. They used to sing. They used to play. But now their lives are just empty relics of what they used to be. They've lost their usefulness. They've lost their dreams. They've lost their reputations. And in some instances, they've lost their lives. They're Christians but they're filled with self. Self-willed, self-assertive, self-centered, self-opinionated, filled with self-pity, self-enthroned instead of enthroning Christ on their life, demanding their own way rather than God's way. What is the condition of a backslider? His state is insecure because in, he has no sense of salvation security whatsoever. He is filled with apprehension and with uncertainty. And a man who gets away from God, the first thing he loses is the awareness that if I died today, I'd go to be with God. His profession is insincere. In, he's in church. He may be teaching, preaching, still holding an office, but he's a backslider and there is no sincerity about his whole life. His life is inconsistent for our testimony and our life are to be one and the same. And his service is ineffective for he serves in the energy of the flesh instead of the energy of the spirit and he bears no fruit to the glory of God. What is the correction of a backslider? 
get back to Bethel. You remember Jacob? Jacob, that brother who was running for his life, and he stops down at a place called Bethel. He calls it Bethel. Because there he dreams and he sees the golden ladder and angels ascending and descending. And in the morning he said, this is the house of God, Bethel. Now he's been in a far country and he's on his way home. And on his way home, God says to him, get back to Bethel. For you see at Bethel, we see Jacob at his best. When you see him cheating his brother, you see him at his worst. When he's dreaming of angels ascending and descending, you see him at his best. When you see him tricking his dad into believing that he is his brother, you see him at his worst. You see him at his best when he's wrestling with God, the angel of God, and demanding a blessing. You see him at his best when he's commanding his family to bring their idols and he buries them beneath a tree there on the way. You see Jacob at his best when he's making his way back to God, to the house of God. Remember the good days. Recount your wayward ways and get back to Bethel. Where is the blessedness I once knew when, fruit, when first I met my Lord? Back to Bethel I must go. Back where the rivers of sweet waters flow. Back to the true life my soul longs to know. Back is calling me and I must go back to Bethel. How do you get there? I want to give you an RC for a backslider. An RC. By the way, when Dr. Bayer invented acetylsalicylic acid, that's a mouthful, isn't it? I'm right proud I said that without stuttering. <laughs> he invented a wonder drug. It was a miracle drug. It does amazing things. It treats about everything. What is that, preacher? We call it aspirin. <laughs> Bayer Aspirin. I call it BBs. Bayer bullets. You can shoot them at a headache, muscle ache, a stomach ache, toe ache, about any kind of ache you got. An aspirin's good for it. The doctor says, take two aspirin, call me tomorrow. A, a BB. But another BB is back to Bethel. And folks, if you're backslidden and you're able to get back to God, You've got to go back to Bethel. What does that mean? The RC is this. Repent and confess. David said, A broken and a contrite heart, O Lord, thou wilt not despise. I was shapen in iniquity. David said, I have sinned, Lord, against you. God, forgive me, forgive me. Wash me, cleanse me. And when he repents in his heart, he confesses with his mouth. Then there's rededication and consecration. For when you come to rededicate your life to God and confess, Lord, I've, I've sinned, have mercy on me and restore me back to the place of blessing, then you say, God, I consecrate my all on the altar. I'm giving you my heart. I'm giving you my life. I'm starting all over, God. I'm coming, and you take me now. Mold me by your will. And the third RC is restoration brings communion. And when you're restored to God, you're brought back into a right fellowship with God. The Lord said it this way in Revelation 2 and verse 5. Remember your first love and from whence thou hast refallen and repent. If you're away from God, repent and come back. Get back to the better life. Get back with God, God's people and God's ways. Back to active service for the Lord. How do you do that? By simply turning around and coming to God. One of the great cathedrals of our world was noted for one of the statues of Jesus. A woman was cleaning the floors one day when a stranger came in 
and stopped near the back of the church and looked and he saw that statue and he was unmoved and he said to her, why there's nothing special about that statue. She said, you must get closer. As he moved a little further down the aisle, he stopped and looked and he said, well, I don't see anything special about that statue. She said, you must get closer. Now he finds himself standing at the very base of the statue and looking up into the face of Jesus. And as he sees the lines in his face and, and recognizes the depth of what's there, he looks down and there's a little plate that says, Come unto me all you labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. And he said, Now I see. And on his knees he goes to cry, Lord, Oh God, be my Lord. You got to get closer. If you're out there and away from God and your heart is empty and your life doesn't have the power on your life anymore and you're out from under the protection and out from under the care, get back to Bethel. Take an RC. Repent and confess. And be restored. And consecrate your life on an altar of God. Do we have anybody here today that needs to do that? I think so. Let's pray.